Hello. It is February 1st at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. I hope everybody is doing well and I hope you had a good weekend and a good week since we last did a video lecture. Today we're looking at colonialism in North America, Central America, South America. And there are only a couple of slides here, so like last week, there's going to be a lot of talking, so make sure you watch this a time or two just to make sure that you have everything down. But I want to start first with the conquest of Mexico. You have Hernan Cortez. He's going to invade Mexico along with about 500 men in the year 1518. He defeated an Aztec force at the city of Tabasco, uh, mainly because he has the advantage of steel weapons and steel armor. Now, Cortez, he is doing this without permission of the Spanish monarchy, and he has to move quickly because he's afraid that a Spanish force from Cuba is on its way to arrest him. Now, he's given a woman at the city of Tabasco named Melinza as a prisoner after his victory. Now, she becomes a teacher to Cortez and teaches him Aztec culture, Aztec language, and she's going to become his personal translator. Along the way, Cortez is going to befriend an enemy of the Aztecs, uh, the Tlaxicans. And that wasn't hard to do because the Aztecs had a ton of enemies because the Aztecs were so warlike and the Aztecs basically killed and murdered everybody and the Aztecs took a bunch of prisoners. So the Tlaxcans, um, they join with Cortez and Cortez and this group of enemies are going to march on the city of Tenochtitlan, which was the capital city of the Aztecs. There he meets the Emperor Montezuma II. And this was recorded as happening on November 2nd of 1519. Montezuma and Cortez meet. Montezuma says, we have been waiting for you. Uh, you are our returned god. Yes, the Aztecs thought Cortez was a god. And Cortez responds by saying, thanks, we are friends. About a week later, Cortez took Montezuma prisoner and left the city. And while he was gone, the remaining Spaniards massacred hundreds of Aztec nobles. Uh, Cortez returns to Tenochtitlan several months later with about 2,000 soldiers. And with the 2,000 soldiers and the help of smallpox, uh, he's going to conquer the city of Tenochtitlan uh, by the end of 1521. Now, the final Aztec emperor is going to be seized and executed, and the Aztecs cease to exist as an empire in 1525. Now, one of your readings for this week revolves around the meeting between Cortez and Montezuma, and it's one of the readings that students such as yourself tend to like, so I'm, I'm interested to hear what you think about it. Next, we have a guy named Francisco Pizarro. Pizarro is going to lead a Spanish expedition into Peru in late 1530 with about 200 Spaniards, where he finds the Incan Empire in the middle of a civil war. Now, smallpox has just killed the emperor and his heir, leaving two brothers, one named Atahualpa, the other named Huscar, to fight for the throne. And Pizarro met with Atahualpa and captured him, which paralyzed the entire empire. Atahualpa attempts to bargain for his life and gave Pizarro an entire room of gold and silver, but that did not save Atahualpa's life. In this entire time, Huscar thinks that he is going to become the next emperor on the throne. Well, Pizarro has Atahualpa executed on July 26, 1533, and then he turns on Huscar and invades the capital city of the Inca, the city of Cusco. And by conquering and invading the city of Cusco, the Inca Empire 
it basically doesn't exist anymore. There's still going to be an emperor. He's going to be on the run. That's another one of your readings for this week is the story of the last Inca emperor, uh, Tupac Amaru. Now, a lot of questions why this was successful. What made Cortez successful? What made Pizarro successful? They both did kind of the same thing. One of the reasons that these two conquistadors were successful, they went straight to the top. Pizarro took out Atahualpa and turned on Huscar and killed both of them. Cortez came after Montezuma, made him prisoner, and then killed him. So it created this power vacuum, and the way those two societies were so top-heavy, nobody actually knew how to fill that power gap. Both the Inca and the Aztecs had a lot of enemies, and both the Inca and the Aztec were very similar. They were very warlike. They took prisoners. They had some human sacrifice. So there are a lot of enemies and the enemy of my enemy is my friend. So Cortez Pizarro found people that disliked the Aztecs and found people who disliked the Inca, made friends with them and used them to take over. You can't overlook disease either. Smallpox weakened the Aztecs and the Inca both very much. And that helps to explain why 2,000 soldiers could take out the Aztecs and a couple hundred soldiers could take out the Inca. And then last but not least, you have to look at the weaponry. The Aztecs and the Inca have weapons made out of wood or obsidian, which is a very sharp glass. Cortez, Bizarro. They have weapons made out of steel, armor made out of steel. They have horses that they can ride to increase their maneuverability. What was the end goal of all this? Well, for the Spanish, the end goal was to create colonies. The establishment of a European style government, a bureaucracy, if you will, led to complete control of local governments. Now, ironically, in many cases, the government that these European countries created resembled the governments that they had just destroyed. So there are some governors, there's some autonomy given, uh, there's the continuation of labor assignments such as the Mieta, which we talked about previously. But eventually, wars in Europe are going to change the way that these colonies are treated. Uh, these wars in Europe are going to require a lot of money to be raised. Now, the money that's raised in the New World, it comes from selling government positions to American and by American, I mean New World-born Spaniards that become known as Creoles. So people were just being sold random government positions. All the money from those government positions was going back to Europe. It's being used to pay for wars. And as a side note, the decline in the quality of administration in the New World was very obvious as we have people that are putting profits before abilities if you have enough money you can be given an office whether you deserve it or not or whether you know what to do or not so there ends up being this real love-hate relationship between the european controlling party and the indigenous people yes they're given some freedoms yes they're given some rights But at the same time, they're kept in the bottom rungs of society. 
and they have some pretty bad leadership that's trying to guide them. North American colonies, I do want to mention them, even though I don't have a specific slide for them. Settlements in North America really didn't begin until the 1600s with places like Jamestown, uh, Quebec, the Plymouth Colony, and they're driven by profit and religious freedom. So they have some similar reasons for exploration but as the Spanish, but with a little bit of a twist. Now a really, really, really big part of this settlement of the New World is with the Columbian Exchange. The Columbian Exchange, it's a term developed by a historian named Alfred Crosby, and it describes the transfer, both intentional and unintentional, of biological materials between Europe and the Americas. And I've got that, that definition right here for you. And there are some really important imports to the New World that you may just take for granted today. Uh, one of the biggest one involves food. Uh, the potato, for example, originally from the Andes, the mountains of South America, it can grow where nothing else could. It grew in wet, cold climates with short growing seasons, and the potato takes off in both England and Germany, and by the 1800s, it's one of the most important crops in all of Europe. Ironically, though, because the potato is not mentioned in the Bible, uh, Northern Europeans remained suspicious of it, and they thought that it caused disease and caused leprosy. Fish from the Grand Banks off the coast of Newfoundland enter the European diet for the first time. And tomato. Tomato first appears in Europe in a yellow form, and that's where the tomato gets its Italian word, which is pomodoro or golden apple. Now just imagine Italian food without tomatoes or elementary school cafeterias without tomato ketchup. The world would be very different. Now the tomato was a valuable source of vitamin C as was the potato, uh, as long as um, you cook it right and don't overcook it. Now as important as potato and, and tomatoes are, it's maize or corn that is considered the miracle crop. For every one grain of, of um, wheat you would plant, you'd get on average five grains of wheat back. Uh, however, with corn, for every one grain of corn you plant, you get about 70 back. It's a much higher rate of return. You can feed so many more people with corn, and suddenly corn is going to become the primary food of Europe. Uh, sugar. Sugar was especially prized for its high profits. The main center of production for sugar is going to end up being Brazil, but Cuba and the island of Hispaniola are a close second. Sugar from the New World became available just as the supply of traditional European sweeteners such as honey started to decline. And honey had been a byproduct of beehives for years. Uh, monks had cultivated bees for beeswax candles, and honey just kind of came along with it. Now, as monasteries were closed in Protestant countries, uh, honey disappeared and would be replaced by sugar cane as the main sweetening agent. And sugar, by the way, was so important that the Dutch gave up the city of New York City in exchange for sugar plantations in South America. We have new beverages from colonies in Asia and colonies of the New World, such as coffee, chocolate, and tea. All of these drinks are high in caffeine, meaning that they're non-intoxicating, but still give you a buzz, so to speak. Chocolate, tea, and especially coffee become approved drinks of the middle class in Europe. 
And there is a close association between coffee and the middle class merchants and uh, companies are formed around coffee shops. For example, Lloyd's of London, it's a major insurance firm in the UK and around the world. It originally started as Lloyd's Coffee Shop. Coffee was very, very important in Europe. Now, not only did new foods and beverages arrive from the new world, but new cooking techniques do as well. If you're somebody who likes barbecue, that was a cooking technique of the natives of Hispaniola. And the natives of Hispaniola, they would take meat and smoke it over a, a, a lattice of green wood and they would cook it slow and it would fall apart when they ate it. The natives called the technique boucan, which passed into French as boucanet, and in English eventually became buccaneer. Uh, the Spanish word was barbacoa, which is where our modern day word of barbecue comes from. Another cooking technique that comes to the New World is the idea of using spices and frying meats. A very good example of this is fried chicken. Now these new foods and the way to cook them meant that fewer people in Europe were going to die of starvation, which ends up leading to population increase in Europe. The population of Europe is going to soar because of this Colombian exchange. That's going to free up labor for the Industrial Revolution. And then Europeans are going to flood back to the New World when we get into the 17 and the 1800s. Now, a bit of a downside. The Colombian exchange is going to make it easier for later generations of Europeans to settle the Americas, primarily because of disease. Uh, disease from the Europeans struck the native populations extremely hard. Uh, native Americans had no built-in immunity to diseases that most Europeans saw as irritating. Uh, diseases like measles, smallpox, mumps, rubella, pneumonia, influenza. Those are all diseases that were commonplace in Europe, but brand new and highly destructive to North and South America. In some areas, by the way, the native population suffered a 90% mortality rate within the first 10 years of European contact. Today, most Europeans of, or I should say most historians of early American history, they estimate that the pre-contact population was probably 25 to 30 million people. But by five, or I should say 150 years after Columbus has arrived, that's down to less than 5 million people. So somewhere between 20 and 25 million people died between, let's just say 1500 and 1650 in North and South America because of disease. And we also have to talk about people in general. Not only do you have Europeans coming to the New World to settle and to conquer, but you also have millions of people being sold and brought into slavery. Slavery came from West Africa, uh, pretty much where it says grains down past this cow to about where the word horses is. This is called the Great Bend of Africa. 
and estimates are somewhere around 10 to 15 million people were sold into bondage and sent across the ocean from Africa to either North America or South America. Now for this week, this is week four, chapter 18. You can see here it says discussion number four, chapter number 18, and reflection paper number one. A quick reminder, there are a total of four reflection papers to complete during the semester worth 5% each. The reflection paper should focus on one of the assigned readings found within the Blackboard Lessons folder. Please use your first paragraph to quickly summarize the article you've chosen to reflect on. For the remainder of the paper, please give your thoughts, opinions, and ideas of the article. The best reflection papers are one and a half to two pages in length, always double spaced by the way, provide a clear opinion or idea, and is convincing as to why you feel the way you do. Now for this lecture, you have a reading from either lesson three or lesson four, so you have a total of four things you can reflect on and you only have to choose one of the four articles. For lesson three, it was the 95 Theses, and it looks like some of you had some very strong opinions about that, so you could consider using it. For this week, there are three readings. The Destruction of the Indies by Bartolome de la Casas. De la Casas is a Catholic monk. He's in the Caribbean and he's writing and explaining everything that he sees. So this is a first-hand account of how the Spanish are treating the local indigenous populations. The second one, an Aztec account of the conquest of Mexico, this is supposed to be a first-hand telling of when Cortez meant Montezuma. So you get to see how Cortez and Montezuma acted when they met and what happens there. The third one, Tupac Amaru, The Life, Times, and the Execution of the Last Inca, talk about how the Incans fall apart after the death of of Huscar and Atahualpa and after the seize, seizing of the city of Cusco. Now of course those three readings you do have to use for your discussion questions. There's a set of questions for each of those readings but there's also like I said the reflection paper too. So just take one of those readings either the 95 theses, the destruction of the Indies, the life and times of Tupac Amaru or the Aztec account of Mexico and tell me what you thought when you read it. How did it make you feel? What is your thought and opinion of what's happening? Really take some time to think about it and put your, your feelings down on paper. Now once again, your first paragraph, your first four sentences, if you will, are just a quick summary of which article you're writing on, and then the majority, make sure you hear that, the majority of the paper should be your thoughts, opinions, ideas about what you're reading. Do you agree with what happened? Do you disagree with what happened? Do you accept it? Do you reject it? Do you have a problem with it? Are you okay with it? Whatever your opinion may be, Take the time, write it out, one and a half to two pages, double spaced, and help me understand how you view one of these readings, what you think of one of these readings, and what your opinion on it is. If you have any questions, of course, you can email me and I'll answer it for you. And also, you may not want to wait till the last minute to do it 
just so that you can make sure you get it done and up. Now if there's anything I can do to make these videos better, please let me know because these videos are made for your convenience and for your your learning. So, you know, I'm, if there's something that would work for you, I'll see what I can do. All right, that's all I have for this lecture. The next lecture will be a little bit longer for next week. And remember, you can always join me 2 o'clock on Tuesdays on Blackboard in the and watch me do these videos. But until next week, we'll see you later. I hope you have a good one. Bye.